how are you all doing today? So ho hopefully you can all uh, you can all see me. I'm just just talking now, so you should be able to see uh, see me and my screen. Hopefully, uh, so Nico, let me know if you uh, if you can't if you can't hear me now. Uh, but we should be we should be good to go. So we got today we've got a really exciting uh, exciting element. We've got Max joining us. Uh, before I introduce Max, actually, there's just a couple of things I want to couple of things I want to uh, want to mention. Uh, at this month's been quite a busy month for me actually, but I've been playing with the uh, the new Avnet uh, MIPI sub dual MIPI card uh, for the Ultra 96. So I've created a really cool little project, so that pulls in uh, image processing and why we might want to use image processing, uh, particularly in the grayscale area, which is kind of unusual for a lot of a lot of MIPI cards. So please take a look at that. And actually, as it stems, and I'm sure Max and I are going to get talking about it in a minute, but we've been uh, we've been chatting and we, we've done it. So we've released a blog today, which is available on my website, which is called How to Get an Engineering Job and Keep It. It's going to be the first of a number of blogs that we have uh, coming up uh, regarding around sort of how to get a job, how to keep a job. And once you've got that job, if you want to, you know how to move into the uh, hallowed halls of, uh, manage, of management. So without further ado, let's introduce Max. Let's get Max to come on camera. And we should be able to, uh, we'll start having a chat and uh, I'll stop sharing my screen so as we can see the video and we'll take it from there. Max, are you, uh, are you there? I am. Ah, magnificent. So there's first thing I want to show you, I really love your, really loving your shirt there. Of, uh, well, this old thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so, I was so encouraged by your, by your shirt that I thought that I would actually match you and join you with my own. So I've got my own fantastically Hawaiian shirt on for this episode, just so we uh, we match. Although we do clash a little bit with with red and blue, but uh, well, I think this pretty much clashes with anything. No, to be this, is, <laughs> this, is, this is this is true. This is true. But at least you're always identifiable uh, by wearing by wearing Hawaiian shirts. So first off, thank you for thank you for coming on the Embedded Hour and having a and having a chat with us. And I guess we should really we should really start uh, with. Uh, how I wish I actually introduce how we actually know each other, and perhaps you know everybody knows everybody knows Max. But you want to give us a little rundown of your of your career because it's been it's been quite interesting. I think you've been you've been there and seen it and done quite a lot <laughs> and made it back alive. Oh, that's the important thing. <laughs> uh, sure, yeah. So uh, well, as you know, we went to the same university, uh, Sheffield Hallam University, Sheffield, England. Uh, we are both from Sheffield. Um, although, yeah, it's embarrassing to note that you went through 20 years, or you graduated to the year 20 years after me. Uh, when, when, when I joined, I, I'm assuming... The worrying is that that's 20 years ago now when I graduated as well. I know, scary, isn't it? And um, I'm assuming that when you were there, you actually had access to digital computers. <laughs> we, did, we did. We had the finest steam-powered digital computers money could buy. Yeah, you got steam powered once. We didn't even have digital computers. <laughs> I know it's going to, if we're not careful, it'll turn into the uh, the Yorkshireman sketch from Monty Python. But literally, when I joined the department uh, back in 1975, the engineering department did not have a digital computer of its own. Uh, there was a big digital computer across town. And we used teletype machines to write our programs. Well, this came later on in the year, of course. But we punched our programs out on punch cards. And then you had to, I mean, in England, it's always raining. So you had to battle through the rain across town to the computer building. And you'd take your pile of punch cards, you'd hand them over the counter. And some surly individual on the other side, I, I, don't, I don't know what the problem was, but they were never happy. <laughs> And they'd say, oh, come back next Tuesday. Yeah, this hand would come out and grab your cards. And well, you go back next Tuesday and the cards are there with a piece of paper on top and a rubber band, elastic band holding them together. And you'd look at the piece of paper and it said, missing comma, line two. And it was like, you found it, but you couldn't put it in. So then you had to go walking back across town, <laughs> put that missing comma in, walk back again, hand your new deck of cards over. And they'd say, "Come back next Tuesday." <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how how fast it's changed. To everybody having, you know, I look around, I look around my office, and I've got more laptops, computers, things than 
things that I want to want to want to admit to, or certainly tell my wife I thought anyway. Uh, it, it, in so many respects, it's incredible. When I was a student, I used to read Practical Electronics magazine and Practical Wireless magazine in the UK. And I was a student and I saw an advert for a single board computer. I'm not sure which one it was, maybe a NASCOM one or something. But it was just the bare board. You had a hexadecimal keypad. Uh, I think it had got 1K of ROM and 1K of RAM and some seven segment displays. And I drooled over it. I mean, I so wanted that. And it was outside my budget as a student. Uh, and I remember at that time thinking, I will never have enough money to own a computer. Yeah, you because know, uh, that's the, honestly the way I felt. And, and now, as you say, I mean, around my office, I mean, it's littered with them. I mean, I've got three 28-inch screens staring me in the face, <laughs> mostly flashing red going, you know, warning, no, danger, Will Robinson. But, you know, it's just changed so very, very much over the years. But it's been it's been a it's been a it's been a really interesting journey to see it change. So I'm assuming that I think we had some of the same teachers when we were at university as well. So I think we had Bill Barraclough, was it for control? Yeah, Bill Barraclough. Yeah. Control engineering. He was he was quite a he was quite a character taught us all taught us all control and electronics engineering. I mean, he was he was old when he taught me, so he must have been he must have been a sprightly young man when he taught you. But, uh, well, possibly the the thing. Well, they all were, I think. The, the thing was that they did the best with what they knew. But again, compared to the way it is now, they didn't know that much. So somebody I mean, gets a, so, so just, like digital signal processing. Okay. That term was never, ever mentioned when I was at college. Because, well, the, the computer we had in the department was analog. An analog signal processing, which no one ever thinks of, ASP, is definitely a thing. Um, yeah, the, no one said digital signal processing because digital resources were so expensive and, and computers were so outrageously slow compared to what we have today that you couldn't think of doing fast, well, fast Fourier, fast Fourier transforms, I think, were invented in or discovered in 65. But even by 80, people weren't really using them that I know. I mean, yeah, so we learn very basic stuff and I I wish I could go back. And also, I mean, it was, a lot of it seemed very confusing at the time. I've, I've discovered so much more since then that I wish I could go back and do it all again and get A's in everything. Yeah, I think I'd pay attention this time. So we have a chap, <laughs> a chap actually who's put in the, uh, I wouldn't spend so much time in the lead mill actually. That'd be, uh, that'd, be, that'd be the thing for it. It's, but it's true, so you know, it's all, we all kind of miss the, uh, you know, you all kind of look back at it and think, well, it was a great opportunity, but if I could do it again, it'd be different. So Nick, actually, Nick Wallace is in the chat, just putting there, so he went to Hallam as well, and he had Bill Barraclough. All right. Uh, <laughs> so Nick, I don't know if you want to put in there, what what year did you go to university? Because she said it sounds like we were there at the same time, so we were there at the same time as me. Uh, I was there from 95 to 2000, and... Uh, I was 75 to uh, eight, uh, 1980. 1980. So there must have been brontosaurus was walking past the department as well. Then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my job was keeping. <laughs> I told I told a young kid once uh, recently that my job when I was a kid, uh, one of my chores was keeping the dinosaurs out of the cabbage patch, and they didn't even blink an eye. Yeah, they they absolutely accepted that. Yeah, you know, that that was a reasonable thing for me to be doing as a kid. <laughs> so Nick, so Nick. So Nick was there actually. He was just saying he was there from 1988 to 19 to 1992. So he, he kind of splits the gap between you yeah. and I quite perfectly. But he also had he also had Ken Dutton as well, which was another one. Of yeah, that's that name sounds familiar too. One of another one over there. Ah, so S. So he did he, so he did SQ, which was the what your course turned into, which was the uh, uh, embedded systems and control engineering. I did the uh, so when I went, there were three paths. There was the uh, SQ path, the embedded the electronic systems and control engineering. Uh, electronic systems and information engineering called easy and the electronic engineering path and I being boring I just did the straightforward electronic engineering, uh, engineering. yeah well you see again embedded was not a term that was in use when I was at uh, university no. so that I guess that brings us on to that so this well, you, could, you couldn't embed something that was the size of a front room <laughs> 
<laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Although I had this discussion the other day, going off track a bit. I had this discussion the other day with my mother, actually, about my grandmother who recently who recently died, saying I had some memories of going round to her house when I was a young child. You know, she lived on Clough Road in Sheffield, and I was saying to her, like, did, did Grandma and Granddad did they have a like, did they have like a front room that they never used? Nobody was ever allowed in it. You know, she's like, they did, they did. Yeah. It's just, just random how how life's changed and how people. People don't do that. Anymore. Uh, that was exactly the same. It's funny. I think about my grandparents a lot now on my mother's side. But that was exactly the same. My mother was brought up in what is one of the poorest areas of Sheffield, Healy Bottom. Um, they, they didn't have much, but they had the pride, <laughs> and they flaunted it. <laughs> um, my mother didn't get. You know, my there was as there was my mother her sister, her brother, her parents and her grandfather living in the same house. It wasn't big. They didn't have a kitchen. They had a big metal stove that was in the front room. Mm. And they they had a, a formal room. I mean, this is a tiny house. Um, but they had, a, they had a formal front room that no one went in. It was only for weddings, christenings and funerals. Amazing. Isn't it? Anyway, we are doing this two Yorkshiremen thing, you know. When you get to, I know York, it's, you know, it's weird, you isn't it? Talking, you end up talking about how, how uh, you know, how life, how life stuff, and uh, how we, how we, all, how we all had it tough. But well, so when I phoned you to, when I phoned you actually, when I was looking to, looking for actually to come on and, and have a chat with you, we actually, as, as two Yorkshiremen do, when you get when you get chatting, uh, we actually got talking about this uh, this blog series that we've just been just just released, which is sort of how to get an engineering job and keep it. Yeah. And I think I think that ties in nicely to our previous engineering, uh, into our previous engineering discussion about universities and such like, because we realised it was quite a, as we were talking about it, uh, we realised it was a multi multifaceted aspect of what you might you know are you even studying the right are you even studying the right course you know are you looking are you, are you should you be doing a degree at all you know and then once you've got a degree you know how do you use that to translate it into getting that first you know getting that first foot through the door is getting an engineering job and it's all it's all quite challenging i'm sure you know i get a lot of people asking me about my journey and your journey and uh, well my journey they ask me about my journey i'm sure you get people ask you about your journey uh, into being engineering and it, it's kind of fun to share with 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 the people so you wrote most of, you wrote most of this blog, you you wrote most of this blog while i was doing uh, doing something else but what uh, I mean, what I mean, it's important. What, what's your key? What's your key message from this this blog that we've just put up there? That, well, that... so the, the, as you know, we're doing this one in three parts, and the first one was the precursor to going to your first interview, uh, and it starts off back at high school because when I went, uh, I always wanted to be an engineer. Uh, I wanted to work with robots and spaceships and things. And I, I practiced hobby electronics, again, reading practical electronics. Uh, I think Practical Wireless had a Take 20 project where it was less than 20 shillings, which was the old English currency. So this is before 1971 uh, and less than 20 components. And when the magazine arrived every month, I hopped on a bus to the local components store, Bardwell's, uh, down near the Abedale Cinema. Uh, got the bits and pieces, brought them back and made things that made annoying sounds and whatever. Um, so I knew I, I wanted to do that sort of thing, but I'm, I'm hands-on. Yeah, I'm always making things and doing things. And when we went to the careers day at school, uh, I was with my parents and you met the careers officer and you know, it was like next and you went up and he said, yeah, so what do you want to do? And I said, well, electronics. I said, great. They've got courses for that at university. Next. And that was it. So I, all I knew was electronics. I mean, all I knew to ask for was electronics. When I applied to the universities, I, what do you want to do? Electronics degree. Uh, and I, was, I started it, and it was all academic, uh, predominantly academic. I mean, it was calculating angular momentum of electrons. I mean, it's like, what? That's the sort of thing you can do in the privacy of your own bedroom sort of thing. So at the end of the year, or close to the end of the year, I went to my lecturers and I said, I'm not enjoying this. And the, you know, they said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to work with robots and spaceships and make things do things. And they said, oh, you want to be on the control engineering course. 
It was like, why didn't you tell me this a year ago? <laughs> but yeah, it was my fault as well because I hadn't taken the time to look stuff out. And like you say, a degree isn't for everybody. Yeah, it's not. I'm sure it's a lot easier now than it was when I was a boy, but it, it is hard work. And some people are not into that sort of thing. And so in the UK, as you know, you've got HNCs, which is like, like the first year of a degree, or an HND, which is like the first two years. Or I think you've now got foundation degrees, which yeah, are like the first three years. Ah. And I think those are a great idea for a lot of people, especially because the, the one trick is if you take one, if you've got a long-term goal, make sure this isn't going off that way. There's no point in taking a one-year or two-year course and then finding it doesn't count towards the one you really want to do over there. Yeah, have a plan in mind and stuff. Over here in America, they've got associate's degrees. So that's two-year degree at community college, which is way cheaper than university. And then you go on to uh, university to do the last two years. It's interesting. So I'm just going to come in. It's interesting because in the UK, obviously, degrees used to be, there was no fun. You know, you didn't have to pay fees for a university degree. You know, you paid. I think I, I think my, when I did it, my, the, the local council paid the, paid the university when my the grant my, so the council paid the grant and the government paid the tuition money, i never actually got any money but the council actually paid the university for me to for me to attend i think right. when my brother i think when my brother went he had to pay a small amount each year maybe a thousand pounds or something towards and i think now it's like america where it costs now a fortune it, now it's nine now it's nine thousand a year or something i think the last the last graduate i had when when she started working for me she got a 50 she just literally left university um and it was she got like a fifty thousand pound debt hanging over her head the day she started working uh, but what's interesting to me is i do i did a lot of um like you know sort of stem outreach type stuff you know careers fairs and stuff when i was back when i when i wore a suit for a living and it was really interesting before before the government brought in the nine thousand uh, pound a year sort of uh fees for people you know parents would come up to you and they say oh you know tell tell my son or my daughter how they've got to get an engineering degree and the, then it can get them they'll get a great job and they can go see the world and all that well, and that's, that's perfectly still true but actually after they brought in the fee what happened was a lot of people would be coming up saying do you do apprenticeships do you do you know do you do apprenticeship do you do different routes into getting it and i mean the companies i work for they did do apprenticeships where they would take you on they would qualify you to send you to college while you were working they'd pay for it yeah. they'd pay for wage you get at the end of it, you'd get a HNC, HND maybe. And if you wanted to, you know, they'd then sponsor you and then go on and pay for your degree and a, or a master's. Well, the other thing there is if you do an apprenticeship, I actually did an apprenticeship, but it was part of my degree course. I was over here, they call it a co op uh, in America. Over there, we called them sandwich courses. I don't know if they still do. And there were things, there were thin sandwiches. <laughs> you had six weeks in, six weeks out, six weeks in, six weeks out. Uh, I was on a thick sandwich where I think I was in for the first year, out for six months, back for a year, out for six months, and so on. And my first period out in industry was to do uh, an apprenticeship at Rolls-Royce Aerospace. Um, and I think that was a four-year apprenticeship course, but they boiled it down to six months for the, a group of students. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was mills, drills, lathes, uh, oxycetylene welding, arc welding, um hydraulics all sorts of things and real hands-on stuff uh so if i hadn't been doing the degree if i'd been doing that four-year apprenticeship i think that would be a really good way to go yeah, it is um, really and the other thing is it this is a really tricky thing because i i know over here if having a degree <coughs> counts for a lot yeah, actually, I just—I was just going to put on that point. Actually, so someone he, just posted yeah, here. Graham, uh, Graham. Graham just posted in there about saying, and I should—I'll read it out for everybody. Saying that you know he wants to challenge us on the fact that a degree, uh, you know, isn't that we're absolutely right on what we're saying about these alternate routes and degrees for everyone. But you know, in the US, it's very you know these these. Well, tra yeah, transferred into a PhD because now when I was young, if you when when I graduated, if you had a degree, that was considered to be pretty good. Um, whereas now, almost. You know, it's like you have to have a master's to stand proud in the crowd. And what Graham's saying is that, you know, you almost have to have a PhD. The thing is, you can spend so much time at college, you never actually get around to doing anything real. 
it becomes a, it becomes an industry and it, it, it's kind of gatekeeping for people and and H and it's really nice i mean i'm the world's worst critic of hr departments i really don't know what they had to come to be honest but mm -hmm. for them they want to see like oh somebody's got a bachelor's degree and somebody's got a master's degree the one with a master's degree must be must be better qualified than but uh, somebody on very i know like, i know people who have got doctors phd's who are apart from one narrow little field they're as thick as two short planks seriously and i mean we we know some of the same friends through the internet you know uh, we won't mention names but there's a i've got a friend in australia who is my go-to if i build a, a a radiation detector that doesn't work i just put it in the post of australia and he fixes it <laughs> Uh, and he hasn't got a degree, you know, he did a technician type course, but he's the one that they send all over Australia into the outback to when something goes wrong in an unusual way, because he can fix it. He can out engineer most of the people I know under the table. I think I think some people have a natural aptitude. You know, I, I, I like to think I'm one, but I think a lot of people have got like a natural aptitude for doing for doing engineering. It doesn't really matter whether they've got that piece of paper. It just sort of it just sort of clicks with them. And, yes, and, I think that's true. But, or, or the, but it's like everything else. You can either have a natural skill at it or you can work hard at it. You know, some people don't have that natural feel for it, but they want to do it and they want to do it enough that they go out there, they learn stuff, they keep abreast of everything. I mean, one of the guys we know, uh, Adam Carlson. Oh, yeah, I know Adam, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just saw an interview with him uh, on the thing. I was watching it this morning. <laughs> but he's a mechanical engineer who designs electronic systems, and he's an aerospace engineer who designs submarines. <laughs> he really does. He really. We must. I must he actually around. <laughs> I must actually reach out to him and see if he wants to come on and talk about his designing remote control submarines because I think that. Oh really, yeah, no, he's I think, well, I think, again, he, like he says, he's not an electronics engineer, but. Because he, did, you know, if you look around his home office, his oscilloscopes everywhere. He got into it because of the submarines. He wanted to make these model submarines and the radio control submarines. I didn't know you could do that. But he designs his own radio control systems and everything. And he said he was at work once at this aerospace company, and there were everyone was they got a problem. They got this really weird signal looking on the oscilloscope, and he said you, you've got two signals there. You've got a carrier signal and you've got some noise signal on top. And they go, no, 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 no. It says, yeah, look, it's periodic. You know, let's put this low pass filter on. Let's do this. Let's do that. But, you know, isolated it, found the freq fundamental frequency. He goes, yeah. that's a motor. <laughs> 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 and again, knowing the, the airplane or area, he knows that this motor and this thing is doing yeah, you know, running it, this revs. And he goes, you've got rev. interference from that motor over there on that wing. And they're like, what the hell? <laughs> But yeah. you're only a mechanical engineer. <laughs> yeah, but this is where companies fail at times as well, because they do kind of silo people into sort of you're a mechanical engineer, you're an and I've even seen it between like you're an electronics engineer, you're an FDJ engineer, you know, you're an embedded software engineer. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's well it's, one of the things that I'm going to talk to be you know, we're going to talk to people in the future blogs is to not get yourself siloed. Um, and one way to do that is to read stuff. I mean even things like Scientific American or Discover Magazine over here or whatever, um, it, there are articles covering all the different branches. And I'm not saying, I mean, first of all, you have to like reading, and I like reading. And I'm, I'm not saying that I'm going to be a biochemist or anything, but I mean, I did chemistry and physics at school. And I like to think I'm fairly well read. You know, you meet some people who all they know is their profession that's all they read they never go outside the the boxes uh, and i like reading books on maths physics chemistry biology uh because i think first of all it just makes you a more rounded person but it means that when you're talking to somebody who's doing something weird with biological systems you can say oh, i wonder if you've thought about this you know, you could maybe, you know, take what you're doing and add it to that bit and, you know, get, get this more holistic view of things. Well, I, I, certainly every time I talk to you, I mention, I mention I'm working on something and you go, well, that's interesting. Have you, have you seen, have you seen X, Y or Z? You were doing something <laughs> slightly tangential, but actually is quite kind of related to it. And I think, yeah. I, I think you're right. I think that's, 
I think it's a good idea to like kind of read around your subject and to, and to look at your subject. And I think it's, I don't know, for me, it's always been to try and avoid being siloed. It's always been sort of, you know, ask lots of questions and be, I guess, mm -hmm. be very vocal about what you want to do. I mean, we, I don't, I can't remember if we put it in the blogs, but one of the, one of the best pieces of advice somebody gave me years ago, actually, is that it, it's, you know, it's your career. Um, but while companies will do their best to help you address it at the end of the day and help you address where you want to go and what you want to do, at the end of the day, you know, the company's still got it. it it's I at the company is on, well, we need to make widget X to make a profit, to pay the bills, to pay the shareholders, to pay the staff, to pay that. So the companies will put you where it where it needs to go. So you need to be oh, able yeah. to navigate that trade-off between am I getting what I want out of the company or is it time to look externally? And, and, and well, there's that. You don't, want to be, you don't want to get a reputation for bouncing from one company to another like a yo-yo. I mean, yeah, at some point people go, well, you yeah, know, is it worth having him for six months? Um, but you can make strategic moves and everything. And, and one thing, I mean, as you know, I'm always pushing people for this practice writing and practice speaking and engineers it, it's, you know, it's hard to talk about big groups, but as a whole engineers typically aren't great at communication. Yeah, the great the problem solvers. Give me a problem, I'll solve it. But I know people who are designing slave memory stores forty years ago, and they're still designing memory systems for things. And it's like the professor in uh, Independence Day, the movie, where he goes, "They don't let us out very often." I mean, these people are absolutely expert at what they do, but they, they gradually get moved back in cubicles to the, the very far side of the room. Yeah, where the, where the lights have failed years ago, <laughs> it's flickering lights and things. Uh, and, and learning, I mean, and I I was not a writer. My mother still cannot believe that I make my living today writing. But I sort of I grew into it, and basically that's what I do all day. And practice, practice, I'm and the same with speaking. You know, a lot of people are terrified. I mean, they don't mind standing around with the friends in the bar. But put them on a stage with a, you know, I mean, some as little as 20 people, but a couple of hundred people. And I've seen old grown engineers just power, literally, you had to go and carry them off because they just locked up. And if you can speak, I mean, I've traveled, you know, not boasting or anything. But I've been really fortunate to travel the world, you know, and somebody else has paid, which is the only way to travel, trust me. I'm, I'm going to come in. I'm going to come in. Alex. I, I, I obviously I completely agree. I mean, most people know me, and I ended up doing this live that I, the, 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 my engineering consultancy that I run now because I wrote a blog and I wrote some papers, you know, and that and that blog turns into things. And it gets your it gets your name out there. It gets you. Well, that's how we met. And it I is. just remembered it was uh, what's his name, Steve, over at Xilinx on the Excel Journal. Was it Steve? Oh. No, it was Mike, actually. It was Mike who sent you 10 years ago. Really? Today, 10, year, 10 years ago this year, I sent Yeah, Mike sent me a message saying, hey, you've got this young lad called Adam. <laughs> that, that, I got hair back then. Right? Right? Yeah, I remember those days, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I never thought I'd be sporting a reverse Mohican myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he said, oh, I've got a young lad, right, Adam. He writes a lot. You know, how about, can you use him to write some articles for, I think it was all programmable planet? Yeah. And then I was doing something, I was flying out to JPL to give them a talk on radiation. And I got some questions and I called you up. We'd only communicate by email at that time. And I said, hey, I've got this, I've got to go out to JPL. And I mean, yeah, they thought I was an expert on radiation. I was like, can you tell me about radiation? <laughs> well, you, you were by the time we'd finished the call. Oh, well, yeah. That, that's one of the things we talked about, having confidence. If somebody says, can you do this? You say yes, and then you find out how to do it. <laughs> but it is it is like, you know, I mean, it's a, and then, you know, once you, it's it's amazing how you write a few blogs, you know, you you submit a few talks at conferences and you go you go talk. I mean, when we first started, you know, the first, I think you first invited me out to what was then Design West, must have been 2013, maybe something like that. Yeah. I was absolutely terrified. You know, I didn't, I, was, I wasn't really normal, used to speaking in front of, of people or anything. Well, no, normally only time to speak in front of small groups of people, clients or whatever. But 
you know, over, over years, you just kind of, you know, you just practice and you just... Well, the, the other thing is people, I, 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 at one stage I was uh, in charge of recruiting people to come and talk at the Embedded Systems Conference, which was an incarnation of Design West, or Design West was an incarnation of them. Mm. Uh, and I'd, I'd say to people, you know, why don't you present, you know, present a paper, you know, I've got a good, you've got a good chance it'll be accepted. <laughs> Uh, and they go, but I don't know anything. It's like, you've just been telling me about what you've been doing. And it sounds incredibly interesting. And, and the problem is everyone thinks everyone else knows what they know. And really they don't. No. You know, so, and the great thing about conferences, is if you already know it, you don't go to that talk. But there's a load of people who absolutely didn't, it's like, I couldn't speak at a conference. You know, and and they, they, they tell themselves they couldn't do it. It's like when I was reading Practical Electronics, again, back in the early 70s, I had no idea I'd be doing a monthly column for them now. I mean, I, I assume that anyone who wrote for that magazine must be, you know, Dr. Spock level. You know, all you have to do is like you know, home teaching. All you have to do is stay one chapter ahead of, ahead of the students. One chapter ahead of the students. <laughs> it, it's true, but it's a bit confidence. So, so we've talked a bit about sort of like making sure that you've got the because we're, we're just wandering about a bit here, really, aren't we? But we've talked a little bit about you know making sure you've got you know making sure you pick the right course and the right the, the right route, you know, not just focusing on the pure technical skills, but the wider the, you know the wider skills such as you know communication and well communication and one thing I would say is the Toastmasters, brilliant Absolutely. organization. Join that; they'll lead, they they don't just throw you onto the stage; they they guide you. But when you learn to talk like that, it's going to impact all of the, uh, everything that you do. It's going to make it better. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's quite a, it took me a long time to get comfortable talking, uh, talking to well, And also people. get internships rather than just get a summer job. If at all, part of, you know, the, in the, we were talked about this, this blog, somebody suggested this because we put the call out to our friends and things saying, you know, what do you think we should talk about in this blog? Uh, and somebody suggested that when you get, you know, if you've got a summer break, yes, I mean, always get a job somewhere. But if you can get an internship doing real engineering work with a company, go for that. That would be great. Um, well, I made a couple of notes while I was talking to you. Oh, well, we we're just talking now. Questions. You know, when you get your first job, don't be embarrassed to ask questions. When I got my first job at International Computers, I mean, on the one hand, you're like, I am an engineer. And on the other hand, you're like, I really don't know anything. <laughs> and they'd, they'd have these, uh, every couple of weeks, they'd have a lunchtime talk. Somebody in the department or they got someone from outside to come and talk about something. And so we'd all go there, all the young engineers and some of the older ones and everything. You sit there listening to this talk on something. And invariably, the the presenter would say something that I didn't quite understand what it meant. But I didn't want to put my hand up because I didn't want everyone else, you know, like my superiors and my peers think I didn't know what I was doing. So I'd sit there going, damn, I wonder what that was. And there's one guy there called Joe Taylor. I mean, I remember him to this day. I, I'm not good with names and faces, but I remember Joe because he'd put his hand up and say, excuse me, you just said this do you mean this or do you mean that or is it something else? And I would sit there thinking, thank God, Joe, thank you. And it took years before I realised he knew the answer already. He was only doing it for the us younger ones. Younger ones, yeah. And I've started doing that myself if I'm somewhere, if I'm at a talk at ESC or something. I If I see somebody looking puzzled, if I know the answer, you know, I, I, I won't say the answer, I'll just ask the question. You know, and get them off the hook because sometimes if you miss one bit you, you you lose all the rest of it and the other one was uh try to find a mentor and i think things have changed so much because i get I, like you get emails all the time people ask you for, to recommend books a lot people ask you to recommend how to get into flying you know working with nasa uh, and a big one is i i from so many young engineers they've just graduated they've gone to a job and the company said, right, your job is to go and design this piece. Off you go. And they don't know enough to do it. They don't know enough to start doing it. And it's like, how do they get going? And, and I was fortunate, again, because at ICL, 
um, they had, which was uh, the UK equivalent of IBM, but much smaller, but did some very great work in the early days of computers and mainframes. And I was on a team designing CPUs for mainframes. And my first job was to design a barrel shifter. And it was 100, 128 bits wide. Uh, and it's a shifter rotator, so it could rotate data around or it could shift it left or right mm -hmm. um, in one clock beat. And it had to be divided across eight ASICs. Each ASIC had got 2,000 gates. Yeah, so you couldn't just do it in one ASIC or anything. And they were pin limited as well. Yeah, it was great. And I, I've, I've talked about that in this blog. If I had been given the specification, so the specification for this one unit was you know, about that thick. Mm -hmm. If I had been given the spec at the beginning, I would have run around screaming. But I was in that company, everyone was assigned a mentor. And my mentor was a guy called Dave Potts. And I thought Joe and Dave were like as old as the hills, but they're probably only about four or five years older than you know, the intake sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Dave Potts would, came to me and said, right, you know, your job is to do a barrel shifter. You know, binary, pure binary shift, any N number of bits, and, you know, off you go. So I went off and did that bit, and then came back and he said, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we, when you shift things, you've got, to, you know, we got rotates, you've got a logical shift, you've got arithmetic shift, it works different. You know, go off and do that. And you go and do that, and I it come back and you're like, oh, it's got to do BCD as well. <laughs> <laughs> What's BD, BCD? And, and he laid it up, and it was the best training I ever got. But if I hadn't had him there as a buffer and as a, a personal trainer, I don't know where I'd be today. So one, one of the things I'm going to end this series with, at the beginning it's find a mentor, at the end it's become a mentor. I think that's I think that's really important. Actually, you have to kind of pay it back a little bit, don't you, for what yeah. you know, people who've helped you. I mean, and I'm going to echo that thought. You know, I mean, I had a really good a really good mentor when I first started out back at back at Raytheon. Actually, another guy from Sheffield, actually. <laughs> just as just as these random things happen, he didn't quite go to the univer university I did. But again, he was a good you know he was a good mentor. He taught us taught me about FPJ design. You know, he. he he didn't sort of like like you like you. He gave me enough rope to hang myself, but didn't sort of ever 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 scare me. And it was really kind of interesting as he walked through. You know, he's like, well, I see you've designed it doing it this way, but have you thought about doing it this way or this way or this way? Right. Never never just go, oh my god, what have you done? It's terrible because it probably was. You know, but you, you kind of structure people through it and and navigate them through it. And yeah, he was a really good one about sort of building some confidence as well you know have, have you programmed it onto it have you programmed it onto a board have you designed a board yet you know let's let's get you you can design this one it's yeah. nice and simple you know design this you'll follow you'll go all the way through the process you'll get the un, you'll get the understanding of it and you'll learn not only about the things such as like you know the schematics and the layout because that's relatively straightforward but actually you know component selection you know navigating through the company's actual internal that's, that's the yeah it's, the, unfortunately that's quite the boring stuff but you've got to master that it, it is, you know, you think you come out of university, you think you're going to be designing boards, writing code every day, doing what and the reality is you're going to write an awful lot more Word documents and PowerPoint presentations than you are, uh, than, you, than you're ever going to design. Well, the design. problem is it's easy to make one thing that works, but converting that into a thousand things that all do the same thing. <laughs> it's a completely <laughs> different ball game. Yeah, it does take a lot of time and design analysis and such like to, uh, to, to do that. But yeah, I mean, we had a, I mean it's just... It just look, but then now say nowadays, you know, I mean, whenever people email me, you know, as long as the, as long as they're not asking me to actually do the work for them, you know, <laughs> I always, you know, I, I, I always kind of reply back say, I'll give you a few hints and pointers, and you know, we can talk about your discussion, we can talk about your thoughts, uh, but I can't, I can't quite yeah. do it. It's obvious you're asking me to do your homework, but you know, I, I get it. I, I, I must spend maybe a good five hours a week or so, maybe a little bit more. E replying back to people's questions, emails, questions, and answers, just trying to give them little pointers or help them out or, yeah. or whatever. And it's all, it's all I, I see this sort of guy giving back to the engineering community because it's it's been so it's been so good it's been so good to me. But we owe it to the younger guys, you know, to, and, and girls as well, you know, obviously to uh, to get it to get it going. Well, so the, so the other thing is, you know, it ripples out. It's I've always thought, you know, if you're walking down the corridor, you know, if you just smile at the people that you're passing and say, hi there, good morning, whatever, rather than having a frown on your face, that smile goes a little way. It's a ripple. 
and I think it's been proved now, you know, there's, there's people have got more time on their hands than I do, but they've actually proved it that if you if you do something nice to someone or just behave nicely to them, you increase their mood, the positivity a little bit. And when they meet the next person, that rubs off uh, just a, a fraction of a percent, but it, it does move out. It does. And so if you, if you're, you can lead by, you know, role, you know, setting a role. And if you help somebody and, and, you know, go out of your way, because young people don't realize how time pre precious time is. I mean, I didn't. Whereas now I've fit, things into every minute of the day but i think at some stage they, they grow to realize that you actually those four hours you spent with them were a big chunk out of your working day and by being nice to them and by helping out they at some stage will be motivated to like you say pay it, you know pass it forward pay it forward i hope so so actually we've just got a comment from eddie actually in the comments but he's just asking if we've got any uh, you know, in terms while we're talking about getting started, and I'm sure we're going to come on to it in a minute about you know having little projects on the go and and doing little projects. In fact, Max, you've got a really cool project that you're going to you're going to share with us in in a little while. Uh, mm -hmm. But he was asking about learning FPGA development boards, and I mean, there's a range. To be honest, to answer this one really quickly, you know, there's a range of FPGA development boards out there that you can that you can get these days if you want to do. You know, I mean, the I'm a big fan of the uh, the the RT the, the RT boards that uh, that Digilent do if you if you want to work with the sort of the Xilinx the Xilinx. You're things. a big fan of the Xilinx stuff, and uh, rightly so, of course. Uh, and it sort of depends what you want to do with the FPJ. Because I mean, if you're coming from a microprocessor side, but you want and you want to keep that stuff going, then you've got the Zinc Seven Thousand, which is like a, an FPJ and a dual core processor on one chip. Um, yeah, so so that's a good way to go. I always think, I mean, both Xilinx and Altera as was. So Altera is now part of Intel. The new, the hot news today is that Xilinx may soon be part of AMD. Um, yeah, and that's really hot off the press over this last you know, few days, I think. Um, so both Xilinx and Intel, Altera, whatever claim rightly that they cover the whole span from little FPJs to monsters. But I, I'm convinced that their heart and soul is in the monster side. And then you've got uh, companies like, well, there's not many of them around. Microchip Technology uh, purchased Actel and Atmel. Uh, so they've got, and they've got the smart fusion device and everything. And uh, Lattice Semiconductor, they've all got these little development boards and sometimes I think there was one you could get for like five dollars or yeah, something. Yeah, I was going to touch on that. Actually. I've got I've got a little lattice because all, all that I tend to write mostly about Xilinx devices for for, for, for for certain reasons. I've you know I, I work with all of them now, and there are some little lattice, little BX. I think they're little BX boards or something like that that work with an open source tool chain, and they're yeah. they're really they're really quite cheap and they're real they're really actually they're amazingly easy to program and get up and get up and get up. Yeah, and those are good. Yeah. But my, my, somebody's actually just putting that back the pink Z2. Uh, you know, the pink, actually pinks, one of, if you really want to get started, pink's really quite interesting because it works on the Xilinx uh, Zinc devices, but it allows you to use Python to control all the, uh, all the programmable logic. So if, if you're like you familiar with Python development, then you can pretty much hit the ground running. And if you actually look back, if you, if you, if you can't sleep this evening, if you look back to episode two of the Embedded Hour, you'll see you'll see we had Carl from Xilinx on there uh, talking about pink, and he gave quite a good uh, quite a good quite a good demo and understanding and explanation mm -hmm. of what. what there's a, there's another company out there that's pretty interesting, uh, and I'll mention them again when it comes to this ping pong ball array. It's, it's a weird sort of thing. Uh, it's called Alorium, and they've got a ball called a board called XLR8 for Accelerate, uh, and it's the same format, same for, uh, form factor as uh, an Arduino Uno, but the 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 main element, a processing element, is an FPGA. Um, and the FPGA, they've they've coded it so it looks exactly like the 8-bit processor that you use on the Arduino Uno. But it is an FPGA, which means you can program things, and they've got programmable blocks. So the, the Uno doesn't do floating point. 
naturally. Yeah, uh, you, know, you can still use floating point operations, but it breaks it down into you know in small instructions. Well, they've got a floating point in there. Um, PWM they do the hardware the PW pulse width modulation in hardware. Uh, so that's that's actually an interesting way to get into FPGAs as well. I think, I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of interesting ways out there. But I think I think what's interesting is we I think we've touched on it in our in our little blog series as well. Is you know it's always nice if you can if you go when you go when you finally you know you get your degree or you get your engineering qualifications and you want to go looking for a job, you know you want to try and sort of stand out from stand out a little bit from the from the crowd and and sometimes uh, having a uh, you know, having an interest or having a little project out going. Now, obviously, you can't always do that because you might, you know, you might be a mature student. You've got, you know, you've got family or whatever, and you don't have, uh, you have other pressures on your time. But, but sometimes, you know, if you, if you if you can spare the time, then there's a. We're really. It comes back to what we started talking about earlier on, where you were saying, you know, computers used to be the size of people's lounges and such like, and now, now they're so they're so available, and there's a range, you know, from that le- little lattice lattice board all the way. To sort of you know to Arduino's to the Raspberry Pi to the, I, even the Nvidia the, the the you know the Nvidia uh, little sums that are released and the development boards and the you know and the Xilinx uh, the, the, the FPGA type stuff as well so there's a range of there's a range of sort of technologies that you can get and start and create little yeah. and start creating interesting projects with which I guess gives us a nice little segue to talk about your well yeah your, but I, I, I'd, I'd like to follow up on what you're just saying that that is <laughs> true. With- in, in part two, the, the the second blog in the series, we cover two things. One is creating your resume or CV or whatever you want to call it. And then, you know, and the, the thing you've got to remember there is the only goal of the resume is to get you an interview. Anything that's in there that is not aimed at that goal is superfluous to requirements. And then when you get the interview, you know, how to go through the interview and how to, you know, do things and stuff. When if you if you're a, like you say an older person going for a job, you've probably got you know your, your task there is going to be whittling down all the stuff you've done, you know, to try to get it on one page. If you are just coming out of university, where you haven't actually done anything, yeah, you, you've got to accentuate the positive. And if you've got some hobby projects or whatever. Uh, I, personally, I, first of all, I, I'd, I'd say to everyone, always have hobby projects. I, I've always got like numerous ones on the go. And there's a couple of reasons for it. First of all, it gives you something apart from work. You spend all day beating your brains out against one thing. It's nice to have something that you can control that's your own, that you can relax. At. I can relax. Pro- I'm not a programmer, a natural programmer, but I can relax yeah, you know, programming things like the Arduino and stuff. Uh, and I learn stuff all the time doing that. Uh, but also, like you said, it gives you something to talk about at your interview. When I was trying to get into university and they'd say, well, have you ever done anything in electronics? And I'd say, yes, I built a brainwave amplifier. It was a hobby project in one of the magazines. Yeah. And I could talk about, you know, because the human brain, you've got alpha waves, you've got delta waves, you've got gamma waves and so on. And, and the, these frequencies and what you do is you amplify the alpha and you feed it back as white noise or pink noise. And I never, I, we never got around stranger to the fact I never got it to work. <laughs> <laughs> you, but, you all kind of miss that out or the fact that it, well, not- they never asked. <laughs> There's the interest. But I, one thing I want to say about talking about interviews actually is, I think it's really important to remember that interviews are two-way processes as well. It's not just it's not just you interviewing the you know it's not just the company interviewing you to see if you want to see if yeah, they want to see if the company is you right to, for you. you to look at it as well and say whether you think the company is right for you and whether it aligns with you know your 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 goals, your drives, your morals, your philosophy in, in life mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And, and I think sometimes we forget that because you're always kind of too too focused on the will I get the job or not as opposed to is this really the right, the right, the right job for me? And, and the thing is, I mean, there's there's no one size fits all. So some people say you might say I've got no time to do project. Some people, uh, there's an engineering company down the road, and the guy in charge is a mechanical engineer. And apart from, he, he lives for work. 
his, his company is everything. If it's not to do with promoting the company or getting new products out, or, that's it. He's not interested. And I, I find that really hard to wrap my brain around. I mean, it works for him, but I love having projects. And yeah, so I was going to show you this one here. Yeah, yeah, I want to see your project, yeah. So this is... And like uh, a true Yorkshireman, you've got a kettle there, yeah? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Um, so it's basically just an uh, array of ping pong balls, 12 by 12 array. Um, and each one's got a, a WS2818. Oh, like a Neopixel. Or two. Like a Neo, yeah, Neopixel embedded in it. Um, when I think back to the day, you know, the early microprocessors and everything, and you know, they're quite expensive, you know, when they first came out in the early 70s and everything. This thing, the board behind it, for, I can't pull it out, but it's uh, it's called a Seed Unio XIAO. It's the size of a, post, a regular postage stamp. It's a 32-bit uh, ARM Cortex the Zero Plus processor running at 48 megahertz. It's got like 256K of RAM or flash or whatever. Um, it's just, it's a great beast for doing this sort of thing. And... I started off on this because I was writing some articles for practical electronics on flashing LEDs. And it's always nice to have something to go with. Um, it's actually taken a life of its own in a way. Uh, somebody, uh, an FPGA designer at Apple, <laughs> emailed me to say, hey, why don't you have a competition where you let people write programs for your 12 by 12 array? And they can send you the programs, you can run them, you can video them, put the videos on the internet, and we can all vote as to which one's the best. I said, well, it's a great idea with one fatal flaw. <laughs> oh, I know to my cost, you, if you haven't, you know, you've got to have something to test your program on. Because if you don't, you're never going to get a program that works yeah. or anything. And to do that, you'd have to build your own 12 by 12 array. And, and he's not, he's more of the FPJ side. You know, he's, he's not into the electronic side per se, but he's, well, why don't you build a simulator? It's like, yes, you know, if I've got the spare time. But then I started thinking about it a bit more. And the guys that I was just telling you about, Alorian, the ones who've got the XLR8, yeah. they came up with a really clever scheme. So uh, when you're doing the Arduino, there's a servo library that controls servos and motors and things. And so if you want to use that, you start a few programs by saying include servo.h. And then you can use all the servo commands to you know, tie your pins to your servo and so on. Uh, so what they did, because they wanted to use the hardware resources, they showed this really great experiment with, with an Uno, with a servo controlling a laser pointer, pointing at a wall 10 feet away. And then they're at XLR8 with a, a laser pointer pointing. And the Uno's was, if you look at the... Uh, look, at, look at here, you can't really see it moving. You look at the laser dot over there and it's like jerking all over the place. Uh, but with them, they've got the hardware PWMs in the FPGA. And the way they did that was that you can, you can use the include servo.h or you can just swap it out for include XLR8 underscore servo.h. And all the other commands work the same. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's a brilliant idea. And I thought, what I need to do is to create a library the, for the, that replaces the Adafruit NearPixel library. But I didn't know how to do a library. And I got two possibilities. One is learn how to do a library. Or the other one was call the people at the area and say, I've got this great idea for you. That's a great idea. Why don't you do it? Yeah. And so they, they did it. And, and the idea is it actually writes, when you do the show command that normally would write to the display, it actually writes the serial I.O. port. Ah. And it writes the whole array out as a 12 by 12 so you, array. You can see it on the display. So you can actually see things moving around. So, yeah, that was one thing. Then literally just yesterday, it was either yesterday or the day before, a guy called Ken Woody emailed me because he reads my articles in Practical Electronics. Uh, and he said, have you heard of Core War? And I said, no. <laughs> and apparently it was in 1984, the, in Scientific American, uh, one of the guys who came after Martin Gartner uh, doing the computer quiz type 
column. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote this column about something called Core War. He, he and a friend had come up with a, uh, it's like a, well, it's been expanded to like 16 instruction uh, machine code. Uh, but the sort of strange instructions, but you can create, so imagine a memory in a computer that's circular. So let's say it was, I think they had 8,000 bar, 8,000 locations, don't think bytes, 8,000 locations, but it's circular, it wraps around. And you create, you can create in their assembly language, a little program. And then you've got this supervised program that runs this program, one instruction, then this one, one instruction, then this one, then this one. And these are two battling codes that are trying to survive themselves and kill the other one. And, you know, so you think, well, I've only got 144 pixels or memory locations. Turns out that's actually enough to have some of these little mechanisms, only one, two, three instructions big. So you could actually have these code pieces of code fighting each other and display it on here. And then it's like, well, what you'd really want is to get other people doing it, but we've got the NeoPixel simulator. Yeah. <laughs> so they could be doing it on their own computers and everything. And that's what I'm looking into now. But you know Joe Farr? Yes, I do, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I should explain to the people listening. Uh, I come back to England. So, well, before there's, whenever there's not a worldwide pandemic, I come back once or twice a year to visit my dear old mum. Um, and then on the last Friday before I come back to the States, uh, a herd of techno geeks flock across the UK to my brother's house. And we spend, and Adam is one of their number, uh, and we spend the day with a show and tell showing the latest and greatest things we've built and you know, yeah, telling stories of the old days, how hard it was when we were young and how easy the young people have got it today. And, and I uh, think the interesting thing about that, Max, is there's absolutely no alcohol involved whatsoever throughout that, throughout that day in any way, shape or form. Not a single drop. Well, in the that. day, yes, but then at night. <laughs> and then the next, and then everyone who's come stays overnight in a hotel and uh, local to us. And then the next day we all meet up for breakfast at Milazas Park in the cafe there. And then they all head home, and then I get the rest of the day with my mum and my brother and you know, everything, and then I fly back the next day. Well, Joe Joe Farr is uh, one of those guys. Um, and Joe's expert, well, he's expert at lots of things, but one of the things he's really expert at is creating assemblers. And although he doesn't know it yet, because <laughs> I think he was working a night shift in London, uh, he's in charge of the NHS computer systems or something or other, um, we've got a conference call this afternoon where I'm going to try to persuade him to create this, uh, it's called a Mars simulator that simulates this circular array. Because mm. um, what I'd like is an assembly, first of all, I want the simulator that, that can run in C because then I can run it on the Arduino. But then I want the um, assembler that I can write these programs in that will assemble them down to just byte code that will run on the simulator. So I'm hoping Joe's going to have a very exciting weekend. <laughs> That's a nice, it's a nice weekend project for him. So, so I guess we'd better start wrapping up, actually, because we've been talking for about an hour and I've got this habit of turning this hour in this embedded hour into embedded hour-ish. <laughs> embedded hour plus a little. It's scary, to be honest, because, I mean, we've not even touched on hardly anything. I know, I know. It's like, well, we'll have to, we'll have to do another one. Maybe, maybe, we'll, we, maybe we can have another chat before Christmas about it and... Touch it and look but back at If the everyone people. votes and says, yes, we want another one. We want to see Max again. Or, what do you think? Just put, shall, oh, please, shall God, you, shall no. We on, shall we ask Max on again? Uh, before, and we'll uh, we'll wrap up on the other free, we'll wrap up on the other blogs uh, to do it. But so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up there. I'm going to say thank you very much, everybody, for, to, for attending. Uh, Max, thank you so much for, for, spending some, for spending some time. It's yet another another beer that I uh, that I owe you on my incredibly long tab uh, of yours. Uh, the next embedded hour is on Friday the 13th of November. Uh, so we'll be uh, we'll all well, I'm sure we'll all be uh, being very careful that day on Friday the 13th. Uh, but it should it should be a good one. I'll put this up on I'll put this up on YouTube for anybody that wants to uh, that wants to watch it. And if you want to come talk on the embedded hour or you want to you want to ask any questions or whatever then just please drop me an email. My emails uh, always floating about on the on the at the beginning of this recording, and so you should be able to see it. But Max, 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Before you go, Adam, uh, Javier in Spain. You remember when he came over? Oh, I remember Javier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's just asking what's the ble lead blinking in the mad scientist picture. And oh, right. Okay. Let me just pick up the camera again. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. So uh, I think we're talking about the prognostication engine there. Those are big vacuum tubes on top of it that have got uh, near pixels right around the bottoms and yeah. looking pretty good. And then down there, we can just see my Victorian spectrum analyzer. Ah, yes. Like every Victorian household had a spectrum analyzer. Yes, I'm sure they did. Yeah. But if they didn't, they dreamed of it. Um, yes, indeed. If they didn't, they dreamed of it. I, you know, the, 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 it's only a small office. The thing is, this is where I keep all the stuff my wife won't let me have at home. <laughs> oh, I don't. I, I bought a green screen today, and it turns out it's far too big for this office. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, now, I'm now like, I was like... You, you didn't think to measure it before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to have to learn to do that. It's more fun to just click buy on Amazon, I think, than it is to actually <laughs> you can do any measuring. But anyway, look, I, I could do with the green screen. So just I'll, I'll, ship it, uh, I'll, I'll ship it across. Uh, <laughs> anyway, right. Thank you again, Max. Thank you very much. It's been uh, it's been it's been great. Uh, it's been you know it's been. Thank you everybody for coming along and attending. And uh, uh, read the blogs, read the yeah, blog, and, and, and feed offer feedback because the comments are going to be what you know, actually expand it out so that other engineers can go. Yes, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Okay. So read read the blogs, and we'll we'll ask Max to come on again, and we'll talk about. Uh, let me just share the link to the let me just share the link to the blog before I end it all. I have it here, cunningly open. So you can see the blog there. Uh, I should have done that earlier on, but we were too busy talking about being two Yorkshiremen. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah. So Max, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll see if you uh, if you're free in December. We'll, uh, we'll we can, you can more than welcome to come back on for the uh, for the December episode, and we'll we'll wrap up on the. Uh, Rep up on the you ought to get Jarvi as well in Spain because he's done a lot of work at CERN. Yeah, Jarvi's on my list of people to uh to go to go and uh to go and do it. So, oh, cool. uh, what was the name of this? It's Adam. Oh, what's Adam's surname? Adam Carlson. Carlson. Yeah, send me an email and I'll send you his email address. Yeah. Well, I'll introduce you. Right, I'm going to end it at that then, before because we've run on yet again. So it's yet again, it's the embedded hour plus a little bit. But uh, <laughs> well, like as engineers, we always we always we always, we never deliver on time. We're always slightly late anyway, so it's not. Well, it's right. within tolerance. I, I like that. The embedded <laughs> hour plus minus ten yeah. percent. Right, Max, you're a gentleman as always. Thank you very much, and I will uh, I will speak to you later. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Yes, have a great weekend and we'll speak to you later. Bye-bye.